Okay, let's go for it. <clears throat> Welcome to the session. Uh, it's about uh, Cloud Agnostic Drupal. And uh, my name is Floris van Geel. And if you are still on IOC, you can find me at Zelfie and on the Twitters and other social medias under uh, at over OLAP. And uh, I call myself a Drupal entrepreneur, which means that I work about 30% of my time for clients and 70%, yay, used to be 50, I work on product development. So today I'm going to talk about the agenda. There's a few types of cloud. I'm going to explain those. Uh, then the concepts of state, state, stateless, etc. Uh, how to orchestrate clouds, uh, the value proposition that we're currently working on, and to uh, getting a self-service protocol uh, portal, and finally wrapping up. So looking at types of cloud, what kind of clouds are there? Actually, if you look at it, there is no real cloud. Because if you look up the sky, it's now clear, we have sun, uh, but we're actually renting other people's computers. And this whole cloud thing got invented from uh, old engineers that were drawing the network diagrams, and they drew this little cloud in the top right corner where there was the internet. And then when this last century turned, so at 2000, uh, the market started changing and instead of selling virtual machines with VMware and those kinds of products. They just renamed it and called it cloud. So that's why we got cloud. So there's three types of cloud. You have a public cloud, a private cloud, and a hybrid cloud. Public cloud is well known uh, due to all the big brands like Google, Amazon, Azure, AWS, OVH, and all. Uh, uh, those are the public clouds. So you just uh, can can make an account, get your IT validation, and then you can jump in and put your uh, applications inside the cloud and done. The second part is a private cloud, which is usually on-premise, uh, meaning that you have uh, either really in your office uh, some kinds of servers that facilitate this kind of cloud, or you have a special section in a data center where you have co-location, or you have a, a, a vendor which supplies you uh, the full security as if it was on-premise. And I'm really interested in the whole private stuff uh, since what you're actually doing when you're using public clouds is that you're sharing metadata and statistics to Google and all kinds of other suppliers. And personally, I want to control who has access to what and what API I share to what subsystem. Then there is a hybrid type where you mix the best of both worlds. So you have the private things in your own private controllable environment it could be on-premise, but it doesn't have to be. And then you have a vertical scaling inside the public cloud. So just by adding more uh, demands and enough, of course, balance on your credit card, it will go up and stack a lot more uh, of resources in there so that you can facilitate your apps to your public. If we look a little bit closer at the differences between uh, public and private, uh, for user kind of point of view, um, in the public cloud, you have uh, a publicly shared access. In the private cloud, you have private shared, uh, a private shared access and virtualized resources are in both cases. Then when it comes down to security, um, the public cloud supports multiple customers where the private cloud only a subset of dedicated customers. So that's a big difference. <clears throat> And within the public cloud, there is a necessity to have a public internet connectivity. Within a private cloud, it's either by secure tunnels or dedicated fibers or network cables that connect private clouds uh, to your apps and your tool chains. And then when you look at privacy, um, the public cloud is less suited for uh, privacy sensitive information and confidential information and the, uh, the private cloud, of course, is dedicated uh, to maintain and host uh, secret, secure and private information. And in general, what we see is that uh, private clouds have more complications, um, 
get a more difficulty or more uh, uh, complex logic in, in its utilization, while private clouds are hopefully, depends on the vendor, um, able to exchange between clouds from cloud A to cloud B. So now I'm going to tell you something about the concept of state. Uh, there's two types of states. You have stateless, meaning that this is not a cache or a database. And it is um, not frequently accessed metadata because that should be on the spot and be accessible all the time. And it had, has no instance of affinity. And if you lose a node, it's not a problem. So in general, everything which is stateless is like, for example, a React frontend that has a, an access to a caching layer or um, um, uh, something like maybe the, the, um, another app which, which just uh, computes like a Lambda function and it computes A to B. So if, if it goes down and you have a subset of uh, resources, it doesn't matter at all. The other one, the stateful service, it has a database and or caches. So if you uh, 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 turn it down, er, there is a loss of, of noticeable loss of, of that you don't have access to the data. Uh, but it can also include custom apps that hold a large amount of data uh, with regards to the stateless. So if you have small, quick apps, and it goes down and goes up again, then the end user won't notice. But with a big complex app, for example, a CRM or ERP, then it needs to fetch all the uh, content and all the data. So if you have something which is considered stateless, but has a bunch of data, uh, then you can just consider it stateful. So that brings us to when you are architecting and designing around uh, uh, decoupled uh, or uh, services oriented architecture, where you have a bunch of microservices that collaborate together, uh, we hit Conway's law. So that means that organizations which design systems um, are constrained to produce designs which are copies, exact copies of the communication layers and structures of these organizations. So. To make it really simple, Conway's Law for Dummies, if you ask four teams uh, to make you a compiler for software, you end up with a four pass compiler since each team will have its own interpretation and its own realization. Thus, it won't be as effective and uh, agile and sustainable as you want to do it. Now, jumping into cloud orchestration. <laughs> the link shouldn't be there, should be in a different slide. Anyway, uh, we look at stakeholders here on the left side of the screen. Uh, you have the IT uh, ex executives, the IT operations, and the IT users. And then on the horizontal line, there is the, the, the public clouds. And on the uh, total right side, we have the private clouds. <clears throat> so on, from there on, there is a services of APIs and the ultimate goal is to have a unified way in order to target all these different APIs and to be able to transition uh, your apps from cloud A, let's say that's Amazon, uh, uh, to cloud M, let's call it Microsoft Azure. Or if you say, okay, I have some proof of concept developed within uh, um, AWS, then I take it and I put it in my own private cloud since I really want to be controlling who is access to what data. So in order to do that, and I'm specifically interested in hybrid and private clouds, what kind of tools should I use to make those things happen? One of the main key components that we use now for a few years is Ansible. And Ansible is an open source uh, software for provisioning and configuration management and application development tool. So it enables you to uh, deploy infrastructure as code. 
And the cool thing in uh, Drupal.org, there is a project which is called Ansible. So you can find it on Drupal.org, says project, says Ansible. And with that, you can either do it by web form or by uh, a node component. You can trigger your Ansible script. So you have to look at an Ansible script as sort of like a recipe. So if I'm creating a pizza, I need dough, I need uh, some tomatoes, some mozzarella, and some salami and that kind of a recipe and how you assemble the pizza, so how you assemble your systems that you capture and program within Ansible. The second tool that we're using just since recently is Terraform. And Terraform is made by the HashiCorp, it's fully open source. And with that, you can provision and deploy uh, consistent, sustainable uh, uh, infrastructure. So you can program um, Terraform to spin up a new virtual machine, make a new Docker container, make a new LXC container. And then from there you call uh, Ansible and install the little software within the app, within the provision container. For maintaining the images inside the container, there is Packer, also a product fully open sourced by the HashiCorp Corporation. And uh, that is for creating your golden images. So you can create like uh, the same consistency within uh, Fedora Red Hat or within Ubuntu with that specific version, that uh, Nginx, this kind of My MySQL MariaDB and that kind of PHP in order to run your Drupal 9 successfully and consistently. And then we use another tool also by HashiCorp I'm not sponsored by these guys, but it's also for free, um, and where it's, which is called Vault. And with that, you can securely maintain and exchange secrets. So if I start an Ansible script, my Ansible script will go to the Vault, get the, the, the key for the database out of there, install the Drupal, and uh, then set the, the key exactly in the settings.php where it's supposed to be in order for the Drupal website to work. Then jumping to a little bit of a marketing side, the value proposition. With cloud orchestration, you can provide four key components in convincing your team, your boss, your organization, that this is the way to go in order to make your work and your life as easy as possible. You have a faster time to market since everything is standardized and uh, subs Made, made into recipes and programs. Uh, you have um, a cloud uh, total cost of ownership. So every user can see, okay, I'm now running these Drupal websites with these backends and that CRM, and it will cost me so much per month. And if I need to scale up, I just click the button, check if the credit card has enough credits and continue to grow and scale. It makes another opportunity to have a better governance so you can, uh, decide, okay, this application is currently in, in Frankfurt and I got new customers in the States. So I want to also copy all that over or even move it uh, to a different data center. So you can prevent that you have all your important things in the same data center, in the same uh, disk array, where it could be a big hazard if something goes wrong inside that disk array. Another opportunity is that it leads to a consistent reproduction of applications, data, and states of uh, systems. So all in all, it's a great asset. So when you jump to from there to the best practice on top of that, what on the fly you can do a cost analysis. So how much do things cost currently? And how do I schedule that in my growth plans? I can do cost management so that I can maintain and, and make my ROI, the sort of profit out of uh, the services that I bring to the cloud. And the, a real important one is multi-cloud orchestration. So if for some reason I'm fed up with Google, uh, maybe they take too much of my pri private data, I can take that one out and move it to, for example, a German OVH uh, provider where I might have better uh, privacy guarantees. And another best practice great asset is that these kinds of systems leads to more agile software development since your developers just can click on a button and get a new pr pr box provisions to have their greatest ideas uh, deployed in 
So that brings us to a self-service portal. And by having a self-service portal, uh, you enable users. So instead of them jumping to the IT department and saying, hey, Flores, I need a, uh, a box for my new great Drupal website, then, okay, I'm going to install it and provide access and put their public keys in there, uh, connect the CI CD pipelines from the GitLab, and then everything works flawlessly. Oh, what we do, instead of asking, they go to a Drupal website or another front end. And they just click on it and they have access instantly. Poof. Which means that that also reduces your total cloud management costs. So there's a great thing that in uh, Drupal.org uh, that exists since 2010. I was amazed by that. I even remember to have seen this first presentation about Drupal.org slash project slash cloud in uh, Copenhagen in 2010. At that time, it was uh, interesting limitly because the whole cloud landscape obviously was completely different uh, um, 10 years ago. Uh, but this it's, it's a quite old and really mature project, uh, the, the, the cloud project on Drupal.org. And currently it includes all the major public cloud vendors as well as the implementation of Terraform as well as uh, local Kubernetes stacks and all the, well, not all, but most of all the uh, new young hipster technology. And if not, it has an API, so you can just connect your different variant of cloud to this orchestration tool. <clears throat> yeah, so all that stuff, oh, including VMware, this slide says, but. I don't use VMware, but if you want to use it, you can also do that. Uh, so from here, we, what we want to do is on top of that, build it with uh, Drupal Commerce so that we can also open up uh, these kinds of uh, subsystems to corporate as well as uh, business to business uh, clients. And uh, currently there we are in the proof of workflow phase. So early 2021, uh, we expect to have a market ready product and you can follow the development on uh, upal.cloud. So to wrap up, um, by using and, and investing time in, in uh, making Ansible recipes for consistent uh, software configuration, and by adding a Terraform scripts to that for provisioning cloud infrastructures, regardless if it is on-premise uh, on your own systems or inside the Google or the Microsoft or the Amazon cloud. What you can do is dynamically provision new services and new architectures. So far as that we have built those systems into our recipes. However, most of the projects that I see are either Drupal or React based or uh, um, and uh, the other one, uh, another front end uh, Gatsby like component. So if you standardize upon making recipes to have consistent deployments of these kinds of subsystems, you can control them all with Drupal. That's, that's really, really amazing. And I was supposed to have a demo, but that one broke yesterday. <laughs> so we're going to continue that Monday. So if you want to see a demo, we have to, you have to contact me. And that was on the first slide. So all in all, this is the presentation about uh, Cloud Agnostic Drupal. And if there's questions, I would be glad to hear them. And eight people, you can also jump on stage with this limited amount. The contact, yes, I can, of course.
I was wondering how you concluded that public cloud isn't secure. Ah, that's a real good one. Uh, let's first continue to share the screen again. Uh, that's this one. Okay. I'm not saying that uh, public cloud is not secure. It's just dependent upon how secure you have made your application. And there is no uh, discrepancies within systems like, for example, VMware, that they still have backdoors up till today. It is known that expensive Cisco routers also have uh, backdoors. Uh, within Google, you don't know what data is tracked and what Google is monitoring from you. I'm even amazed that sometimes inside a, a TV show, uh, and then I talk about washing machine and a few hours later I get commercials for a washing machine so personally I don't trust Google at all uh, however I know that there is uh, for example in in the whole uh, Tesla section of the GPU computing and and in other subsections that's yeah you don't know how much is monitored and how much of your data is processed on the meta level of course, if you have a corporate account, you will, you, or you can get the guarantees from Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, and so on, that your uh, specific privacy-related sensitive data is not used anywhere else. Another question. When would you say you cannot use the club? public cloud for a specific client, what are you selection criteria? Ah, okay, ah, that's a difficult question. I usually flip it and I ask clients, okay, we can provide you a system where it's your data and we enable that in a private cloud on German soil, which has the best privacy regulations if you care and you value your data and your privacy. If not, no problem. We can deploy you in any cloud or even in a shared hosting if you want to go really, really cheap. And then you sure know that people or world can access your files and whatnot. Another question. Government is the one client that has a no-go public cloud. But how about commercial clients? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, indeed, it's, it's, I'm really glad that our Dutch government, as well as the German government, currently enforces to have like stricter privacy laws and values my privacy and my data. I hope that it stays the same with the, the whole changes that we currently see in society. But I expect good, uh, uh, good kid play by my government. For companies, we see that this, that this is shifting. Um, before, it was usually and only about going quick to market and making huge profits as fast as possible. But currently, we see that companies start valuing uh, sec data security and data privacy. And that is due to that there has been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, recent, recent, that's it's going on for a few years. There's been, there's been a lot of uh, uh, company espionage, uh, even without the big companies knowing about it. And they don't want to um, out that uh, into the statistics and report it to the, the governments. So internally, we see a big trend that it's changing from go as you go as fast as you can with the maximum profit to yes, I do value my data. I do value my privacy and I want to make profit in a sustainable way. And after all, I don't want to be uh, uh, in a problem problematic situation where there is a data leakage and I lose my privacy sensitive information about my clients. So it's a good tendency to see that the awareness of um, corporate world is growing. And slowly they're getting up to the same par or even a better par than our governments are. Uh, next question. We've just done a project for government on AWS. So it depends, I guess. 
Yeah, it really depends. If you are the one with making the great contracts that have the uh, guarantees by AWS that these systems are uh, on a system level maintained. And then on top of that, uh, the question is by Robert Sloches. You work for MediaMonks, which is a, a great big company who really values security. So if you stack all that on top of each other, you can make the same guarantees and you can make the same promises, even in the public cloud. But <clears throat> you need to enforce that and you need to audit that and you need to maintain that properly. We also need to do that in our public and uh, private and hybrid clouds. However, uh, we don't have third party uh, risk factors in there. Another question. Can you do even, can we even do things on a public cloud like Lambda functions or are we currently just stuck with AWS? Yeah, that's a great, really interesting question, Laurie. I found out that there is uh, currently a new subset of open source uh, uh, Lambda-like uh, like input-output functions growing and uh, several stacks are, are developing and I didn't dive into it deep enough to say that the quality of results is the same or better um but there's just so many problems and and i guess that in even it, it's already done it's already like up to par enough or it will get there um really really quickly open whisk yes that's one of them yeah yeah there's and there's a few more but i have to I have to dig down uh, the, the the bookmarks list and look into that but open whisk is indeed a, a, a real good one. Yep. Maybe I can show you a little bit inside the studio. And Larry is, is commenting and watching. Imre and uh, JP are prepping and working. Ah, there's a new question. Ah, let's read it. How can we use cloud based backup? providers and still ramming in control who can read the data well, probably by encrypting it before you back it up that would be the easiest way to do that or get some uh, trust agreement with a provider that you actually trust but yeah encryption would be the best one i guess so just just a question, Flores. How many how many clients are actually using the the setup? There we we we're using it currently internally. Okay. And uh, as a proof of work, and we want to go market ready in Q1. All right, nice. So we're capturing all subsystems. So we know we have it for GT Meet. We have it for Rocket Chat. We have it for. Um, the next cloud and from there on the ansible recipes get to stack up and the next phase for this quarter is to go with that cloud agnostic so did the initial tests in uh, amazon ec so we do the same tests in the google and in the microsoft and then see how much differentiation is on top of that so yeah it's really cool and uh, also, the, the backing up thing, you, you could also back up using uh, encryption. Um, I think most cloud providers do, uh, do support having um, bring your own key. So you could also mm -hmm. um, encrypt it while doing your backups. So you don't have to do it manually. Um, uh, it, it will encrypt in your client while saving it. That's why I'm quite a fan of hybrid solutions that you have your storage and your keys and your vaults uh, on your virtual private or real private cloud and then offload everything which needs to like vertical scale uh, to the public cloud. I have a question for us. Do you, uh, using uh, Terraform, do you run into issues that some things aren't portable from one uh, provider to the other 
Uh, I'm sure that we will, uh, since if you go for business logic, things get more and more complex. And then you see that uh, companies hire consultants to make this logic work into a specific cloud, for example, uh, uh, Google or Amazon or Microsoft. And then getting out of that rabbit hole and putting it in another cloud's rabbit hole, that will be a big issue. So we're not going for that road. Uh, the majority of stuff is, is like the 30% quick win where you can standardize. And that is pretty well supported between all the clouds. So all the things which are common, those are the quick win green fields. And then when it gets complex with custom stuff, uh, yeah, then it needs consultants and it needs experts in, in order to yeah, get out of one rabbit hole of cloud and go into another rabbit hole of cloud. But if you look at the, the Terraform architecture, it's plain, simple, the same. And yeah, it's just that I'm not sure that all the, I'm sure that not all the uh, logics which are unique to or of to specific business logic and so on are implemented but in the general principles that we tested with uh, the packages that i told about like the, the uh, rocket chat app and drupal and uh, jitsi and all these things no problem you can just move them all right nice good to you now we're suggesting a live cd <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a bit too much, but as, as long as I can share the, the slides, it will be fine. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. Um, so I think I should go running up. There's two minutes left, and then you should be in your stage starting. Yes, I, I would like to see if you, if you launch next year, I would really like to see on the next Drupal Jam uh, how it all worked out. Yep. Because uh, it, it, it sounds really, uh, really interesting. So uh, would be a good, good follow up session to see if it actually if the concept actually worked in practice. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. I'm not sure if the organization is listening in, but we need to make sure that that's uh, part of next Drupal Jam. <laughs> exactly. If not on another Drupal virtual conference, I'm just going to continue with this uh, this process and principles. And this time it was the first time that the, this new uh, session was founded and made up. Yep. So it will it will definitely continue. Yes. Nice, nice. All right, I'll uh, leave this one and see if I can find the the one that I'm presenting. In. Thank cool. you, Floris. I join you shortly there, as audience. All right. Thanks for being in the session. That's fun. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, watching and uh, yeah, it was fun. Bye. How do I put this here? Boom. <laughs>